Good morning, friends. May the grace of God and the love of Christ and the blessed fellowship of God's Spirit fill our hearts here this morning. So good to be in your midst. Welcome here. You know, many of us will have certain experiences in life. I want all different, but we will go through a range of emotions, every one of us, from as, almost as low as you can go to as high as you can go. Every one of us, where we're going to have those times in our life. And God prepares us through his word to weather every one of them. When you are high on top of the mountain and everything is going good and your heart's full of joy, be careful. Satan doesn't like it. You will come into a valley somewhere. But be also careful when you are in the valley that you are not so discouraged that you think there's no hope. There is. And what I love about the gospel of Jesus Christ is that Christ suffered all these things for us. Every range of emotion, from the deepest sorrow to the highest joy, is what Christ suffered for us. And he walked through humanity's pathway to experience life just the way we do. You think you are all alone in what you are, are going through? Christ suffered for it. He was in all points tempted as we are. Every point. That's what he, Hebrews says. Writer of Hebrews uh, attests to that. That Christ bore our sorrows and our griefs. He shared in our pains and he suffered for our iniquities. He bore them. And when we bring those to the cross, all our hard times, all our loneliness, all our hurts, don't keep them to yourself. Bring them to the cross. If you keep them to yourself, you're going you're gonna to lose. No question. You will lose. If you're selfish with all your little problems, you're going to lose in life. You will not have the abundance of life that Christ promised. But if you bring them to the cross, and there, there you die with Christ, it's the only way that you will actually live a new life. Take, for example, somebody that can't forgive somebody. Lives in miserable despair and, oh, it's not fair. Life is not fair. And that person did this and that to me. Always negative and thinking about what happened in the past. Will that person ever have victory in and of himself? Not a chance. Now, I'm speaking pretty bluntly here, but this is what I see. So people need to be shocked and jolted out of their negative style of thinking to understand that, hey, this, this is hurting me. I need to get rid of it. How do you get rid of it? There's only one way. There's only one recourse that you have, and that is to come to the cross of Christ, lay it down. I, I don't care what it is that you have suffered or hurt, been hurt with. It could have been your father, your mother, your best friend, your sister, your brother. You have to deal with that hurt. You have to forgive. If you don't, God will leave you to your own devices. And you will be a sad, in a sad state. You want victory in life? You must come to the cross. You must know that you are redeemed not with corruptible things, but with incorruptible things. Or things. And that thing is the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, there is something strange about seeing blood, right? Some people are horrified. Some people get nauseous. Some people get sick. Sometimes you hurt yourself. I have cut myself many times with the sharp metal that I work with. And sometimes it's something, something slips. I'm trying to put a screw in, and then uh, the screw slips. And then there's little half-inch screws, and then it goes into my finger. It's happened about, I don't know, three, four times. A little impact, that doesn't stop right away. Soon. Ah. Then, I, then I think, oh, I can just pull that thing out. No, I can't. i got to reverse that thing. And then it bleeds. Just did that a, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Still have that mark there. 
And then you blood, and I've got to get down off the roof, and it's leaking blood, and I've got to go wrap it up. And then away we go. Don't have time to stop. Blood. Most precious substance on the face of the earth is blood. This is where your life comes from. All the healing in your body, the healing in Lloyd's body is coming from the blood. Taking away impurities and putting forth fresh nutrients that will help his bones grow. Your, your body heals from the blood. If your blood is tainted, it doesn't work right. But we are redeemed with the blood, precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. He, he, he emphasizes this, the lamb without blemish, without spot. When, when the priests received the lambs at the, at the temple in the tabernacle, they, they had to inspect this little lamb that people brought to, for the covering of their sin, for the atonement. They had to make sure that this little lamb was without blemish, without spot. And if it was, that's not good enough. This, this is why Jesus went through the trial, my friend. You, you ever wonder why he suffered so much? Like, uh, like all night he's, the Jews are trying to, they're, they're working with some kind of accusation to, to find some cause of death in this man. He comes before the Sanhedrin. We've just been through the Easter story. but And early in the morning they finally bring him to Pilate. And Pilate is a rep, represents the Gentiles. And here we have the Jews and the Gentiles turning this lamb over every which way and looking at him from every angle, this Jesus of Nazareth, and trying to find some fault in him. And my friend, they found nothing. Every one of them said they kind of couldn't find a thing wrong. Even the false witnesses knew in their heart they were lying. And so they couldn't even convict him on something that the false witnesses brought up. They actually convicted him because of the truth. He has spoken blasphemy. He claims to be the son of God. And this is why he was executed for the truth. And he was verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world that what was manifest in these last times for you. Before the foundation of the world, it was foreordained that Christ would come into this world and die for us. Well, we don't know what happened in, the, uh, in that conference with the Trinity exactly, but we know one thing, that it was ordained of God that Christ would, when it, his time, uh, time was come or was fulfilled, that he would come into this world and he would be the precious Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. Before the world began, this was decided. This is our God's great foreknowledge. He, he knew. History to him is no surprise. A prophet, uh, the future is no surprise to God. He, he sees it in, almost like in a bubble. He's, he's outside of time. He, he just looks and he knows the, end, the beginning from the end. And that's why he's Alpha and Omega. And he became like a lamb. This is the son of God. This is the creator becomes like a lamb. Friends, what, what convinces you of the Bible? The Bible is true. I, I spoke a little bit about that on Passion Week, but I'm telling you, if there is one thing that really convinces me that the Bible is true, is it speaks to my heart personally. I see myself in so many places. I see patterns in scripture. You know, in the Jewish mind, prophecy is not just a prediction. It is a pattern throughout scripture. You find these patterns, threads woven throughout all of scripture, Old Testament right into New Testament. This, this talks about the continuity and cohesiveness of scripture, that only a super intellectual being could actually make this up. And then this is one of the charges of the agnostic and the atheist, oh, this is just a man-made story. But, but you need to be convinced in your own mind that this, this is the actual word of God to me. How? All of those things that happened in the Old Testament are an example for us. Everything that happened in 
the Old Testament to the patriarchs and the prophets, the kings and the priests, the all patterns and types for us to look at and to see not only ourselves, but to see the life of Jesus. Jesus is called the Word of God for a reason, because he is the Word. The Word became flesh, remember? John 1, 14. When he comes back, he's going to have the, the name, the, the Word of God, written on him. Why is it so important to realize that this is the Word of God? This is Christ talking to you? Because Christ is in every scripture of the Bible. And, well, and uh, the thing that fascinates me is, that, uh, say, uh, let's say in the book of Psalms, every psalm that is written, there are quite a few messianic psalms that are talking just about Christ, but in all the psalms, when you start matching it with Christ, you see, oh, Christ suffered that. Christ suffered that. He went through every emotion that we have, my friend. No, don't think that you are so alone, that you, you you're, uh, and you alone are suffering something. Some deep, traumatic thing in your heart. Christ suffered that for you. You, you see this, this flow of whatever prophecy right throughout Scripture. Everything culminates in Christ, actually. But you see this also happening to the, to the country of, or the nation of Israel. A consistent pattern of falling away from God and being renewed in God, suffering sorrow and deep loss, and Christ, or God, bringing them back into a relationship with him. You, you see that consistent pattern all throughout Scripture. And sadly, so many times Israel lost their way. But it's all for a reason. All these things are written for an example to us that we do not follow that example. And so God lets us go through a range of emotions that are sometimes very uncomfortable. We don't want to go through things like that. We want health and wealth. We want good times all the time. We just want to have lots of money and spend it and, and no, no bad times. No we just want to enjoy life. Well, that is part of our problem. In order to enjoy life, you have to go through the way of the cross. And I'll start reading in Psalm chapter 43. Remember, this is the psalmist. I spoke of uh, Psalm 42 on, on Passion Week, and it just kind of continues here a little bit. The psalmist is... Probably in a dark, lonely spot. And he needs some guidance. Judge me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. For, for thou art the God of my strength. Why dost thou cast me off? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Oh, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me in unto thy holy hill and to thy tabernacles. Then will I go unto the altar of God, unto God my exceeding joy. Yea, upon the harp will I praise thee, O God, my God. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet, yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. Now, that, this is almost... A little difficult to understand. He, he, he's wavering. He, he, it's, it sounds like a yo-yo. One moment, he, moment he's down, and the next he's up, and then he's down. And I, I believe the psalm was written to us. And it's, it really follows Psalm 42 because they are actually lumped together in a Jewish, Jewish tradition. But the psalmist is expressing his heart. He's pouring out his heart to the Lord. He feels very alone. Judge me, O God. Plead my cause against an ungodly nation. The whole nation, he felt, was against him. The whole nation was going down a path that he did not agree with. Everybody around him was, seemed to be so ungodly and following along with these patterns of iniquity. 
to eat my cause against an ungodly nation. Makes you think of today, right? We're not even supposed to say God created male and female. You're not supposed to say that anymore. Oh, you might get thrown in jail. You might, you might get persecuted. You know, somebody might come to your door. What are you doing? We're supposed to go along with all this transgender stuff. But the Bible says God made two people, male and female. Today we have an ungodly nation that is set to persecute pastors that do not agree with their, their newfound thinking. He says, oh, deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. Here he's talking about the personal experiences, whatever his friends or neighbors, they were dealt with him very deceitfully and unjustly. I think it's okay to, to pray this. Lord, deliver me from evil and wicked people, unreasonable people. I've met some unreasonable people in my day. It's incredible how people think. Some people are so miserable. That they're almost ready to take a swing at you. What makes them that way? They, they don't have God in their life. That's a good thing. If when you have God in your life, you're not afraid of them. They can rail and rant at you and do whatever. It doesn't matter. Oh, deliver me from the deceitful and un unjust man. I find deceitful people in my line of work. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, I'll pay you right away. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Soon as you're done. And sometimes we don't get paid. Am I supposed to get all down about that? No. For thou art the God of my strength. God will give me strength to make it up somewhere else. And he does. Who of you haven't, haven't lost some money or been in a bad deal? You bought something and it just wasn't what you thought it would be. You, you lost out somewhere. Is it going to make you down for the rest of your life? You gonna harp on that, those few bucks that you lost there? It's not worth it. Just go on. Forgive. God is your strength. I found, or I, I find, whenever I, I seem to have lost something along the way, God just gives it to me somewhere else. Why dost thou cast me off? Here the psalmist. One moment he's, oh, deliver me, Lord, and then, oh, thou art my strength. Yes, God is my strength. Isn't this, isn't this how we are as, as people? We, we come to church and then we're lifted up, and yes, God is my strength, and we, we sing and we get lifted up. And then Monday, Monday morning, a little later, oh, where's God? Lord, why, do you, why have you cast me off? Why don't I feel like I'm a Christian? Why are you doing this to me? Why do I have to go through this? Somebody said something. Why go I mourning because of the, of the oppression of the enemy? Sometimes when you have these deep hurts or these, these deep burdens in your heart, it's because of the oppression of the enemy. Satan will come. Sometimes you don't even know yourself, right? I, I've, I've had those times. I, I should be happy. This is the beautiful weather. Whatever, wherever I am, maybe in the... Even at work, nice job, and uh, what's, what's wrong with me? Down in my heart, it's, it's not as joyful as I want it to be. And I want life to be perfect, but it isn't always. What is the reason for this heaviness in my heart? And then the psalmist picks up again, Oh, send out thy light and thy truth, let them lead me, let them bring me unto thy holy hill and to thy tabernacles. Such a range of emotions. This, is, this sounds like a yo-yo Christian. Now, he, he says he will eventually come to the holy hill, to thy tabernacles. 
See, once the light and the truth hit your heart, they will lead you. And they will bring you unto thy holy hill, unto thy tabernacles. See, I, I think this is one of the reasons why we go through some, why our hearts are not satisfied with money and possessions. Because they tell us these, these mean nothing in my life except to take care of my physical needs. And they are not big. But he says, our hearts long for something else. Our hearts long for light and truth. That's, that's what's going to actually satisfy you. Oh, we want to have a million dollars in the bank. Then, then we'll be happy. Friend, you got that wrong. You will not be happy, happier than you are right now if you had $10 million in the bank. Oh, what do you mean? Your focus is wrong. Money it was not going to satisfy this vacuum inside. It will be God's light and God's truth. They will lead you to the holy hill of Zion and to his tabernacles. Money, money can't do this. Money is filthy lucre in the eyes of God. Money can become a God. This is what satisfies me. Oh, this cash. No, it doesn't. It is knowing God and his son the Redeemer that really satisfies you. It is when the light of God comes into your heart. This is what I love about the scriptures. We don't see everything at once. We, we grow in our faith. And God shines into our hearts as we study God's word and as we long for spiritual things. He keeps revealing new and exciting things to us. Sometimes, sometimes I think of the old western men when the, when the West was unsettled and there were, there were some guys that just, all they wanted to do was just go see what's beyond the next hill, what's beyond, on, on the next mountain. And just, just enjoy the beauty of nature. That, that's what God's word is like. You, you can, we can be like that. We, what, what's behind the meaning of this verse? And life becomes exciting and interesting when, when you start seeing Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Not only that, but you start seeing yourself in the Old Testament, and then you see yourself in Christ. And it takes care of all your funny emotions that, that try to get you off track and are so deceitful. Your emotions are part of your soul, I believe. And we should not walk according to our feelings, our emotions. And I hope I don't hurt anybody or, or say something wrong here, but... Today's Christianity seems to be so centered upon emotionalism. You've got to work yourself into a frenzy. In order to be blessed by God. Live your best life today. All kinds of psychological uh, rhetoric comes from the preachers of today. If it is centered on the Bible, I've got no problem with it. But there, there are people who, who oh, you, you, you don't need to suffer anymore. And then they, oh, now stay away from that group of Christians. They, 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 they're so somber. They're so serious. They're so sad. Is that Christianity? No, that's not love. See, you see, I, 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 this is just me, maybe my opinion, maybe not yours, but I, I don't see... And I, I listen to quite a, quite a bit, or kind of kind of keep track of a little bit of what's going on in, in the world, and even in churches today, what, what they're preaching. And I, I think there is a definite lack of preaching the cross, preaching death to self, preaching the conviction of sin, of the judgment to come, of an eternal hell that awaits for those who will reject the Messiah. I don't know about you, but we need that. That will put the fear of God into you. See, there are those, and I, I believe this is one, one fallacy that is being preached today. Once you say a little prayer, Jesus, come into my heart. I can just live, do whatever I want. God's grace covers everything. Well, let's not diminish God's grace. It covers a lot when we are spiritual children. And 
babies, but once you start growing, you become more and more responsible. And someone who lives just like the world, and you can't tell any difference, he's swearing, he's drinking, he's going on with the wrong crowd, and he comes to church, yeah, everything's okay, I'm a Christian, yeah. You really wonder if that person is saved, because we ought to be different. We need to be separated from the world. You see, you cannot feel and experience God through the elevation of the flesh. Very important for us to understand this. It's no wonder that pastors and leaders, and you, you just Google Hillsong, one of, the, one of the fastest growing churches for a while there, and now a couple of pastors are caught in some kind of immorality on some of the main guys. Why? Why does this happen? I, I think of Jimmy's, I shouldn't maybe say names here, but I think of in the 80s, Jimmy Swagger, Jimmy Baker. Huge televangelistic ministries. And then they fell. Why did they fall? I can only assume through God's word that it was way too much of trying to please man and, and trying to put on a show. And there was not enough dying to self. See, that's what happens in our life. We want it too easy. And we don't want to go through the way of the cross. We don't want to bear our own cross. And we lead others astray. And that's the worst of it. You will be responsible for what happens to others around you that are actually depending on you to show them the way, the truth, and the life. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Before we read, let's all pray with our hearts. Heavenly Father, this morning, Lord, I pray that you put a burden on our hearts. That we need to seek you till we find you and seek with you with all our hearts. Lord, I pray that we would not be satisfied with our spiritual lives. That we would press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And Lord, to know the love of God through Christ Jesus and to know the hope of our calling and the glorious riches of your inheritance and exceeding greatness of your power to us who believe according to the working of your mighty power which you wrought in Christ when you raised him from the dead. Lord, add to us line upon line, precept upon precept so that we may actually acknowledge and revere your word the way we should. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. The first recorded sermon of Christ is this passage here, and I, I want to read a few verses here, verse 3. And this has to do with suffering different emotions. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This, this is not what the world preaches, my friend. This is not what liberal social clubs teach. No, we can't spend time like that. We don't want to be poor. We just want the blessings. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when you are poor and empty and needy inside, unfulfilled. You're blessed. Why? Because now you have a catalyst that will drive you to understand what is it that makes me feel this way? What is it that, why do I have an empty heart? Why do I feel so poor in my spirit? There's a reason, because you are. See, we, we get so proud of ourselves. Oh, my job, yeah, good paying job. Oh, yeah, I got lots of nice toys. Or it could be, I'm, I'm so smart, smarter than my neighbor. I got a better position. I'm a doctor. I'm a lawyer. 
I make more money. We put all, our, all of our identity into what we're doing physically as a job. We forget about our identity spiritually. This is our mistake. Once, once you deal with the spiritual part of you, then you are ready to face life and to enjoy the kingdom of heaven. See, this is where we miss it as Christians. We don't want to go through this valley. You know, in scripture there are two metaphors used to describe trials and tribulations that we go through. One, one of them is a wilderness. You, you think of Elijah in the wilderness. 40 days, 40 nights. He, he, he comes from this great victory on Mount Carmel. You, you would have thought that that victory would have lasted him a year. God answering his prayer and striking that altar with fire and burning everything up. Wow, did I make a good show. <laughs> Just a day later, he is running for his life. Not even a day from a threat from one woman, and he's running. He ends up under a tree, and oh, Lord, let me die, it's enough. This is Elijah, with his, his wilderness experience. From the greatest mountaintop, down into the wilderness. And it was a valley, too. And he wants to die. See, this is where we end up. When we focus too much on the outward show, but that doesn't mean much. Now, if it glorifies God, that's great, but don't try to take the glory for yourself. And so Elijah runs, 40 days, 40 nights. He comes to Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, and all by himself, and this is his wilderness experience. He's all by himself. Friend, when you feel lonely and just dejected and nobody cares for me, that is a prime time for God to do a work in your life. It's the best time for God to reach out and teach you something. In fact, I, I wonder how useful you can be without that experience. So I read in the Bible and uh, almost every one, actually every one of the great men of God and I can think of, they went through something like that. God was doing something. He was molding and shaping their spiritual intent, their, their, their vision for the future. Oh, it was not very nice to go through that. Elijah's in a bad place. He's in a dark place. Oh, just let me die. And then I'll be happy. No. He had to become poor in spirit in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Friend, it is good for you to mourn for your own sin. How will you ever be comforted spiritually if you do not have the true repentance for your own sin? This is another thing I think is missing in our, our churches today. True repentance, where you are actually deeply heart felt sorry it didn't quite make sense there not quite wording but you are you have godly sorrow in your heart for your own sin first for your own condition without God I'm lost my sin it condemns me this isn't just talking about being at a funeral and mourning and God comforting it, it, it does mean that but I believe this this talks about the deep spiritual mourning that you have for your own condition this is maybe why you feel the way you do sometimes. Your heart is mourning. You don't know what it is. You're mourning for your spiritual condition. And you need to be comforted. As you bring that to Christ, to the cross, that is what bearing your cross is, is, is coming to the cross and dying with Christ. That, that's what it means to be, be, bear your own cross. This is where you find new life. And so if you do not mourn for your own sin, how are you ever going to be comforted? How, how are you ever going to help somebody else? Then when you have been helped, you can also mourn for other people. Does it bother you that people are going to hell around you? They don't listen to you. You've tried to say some things. They don't listen. They don't care. 
Doesn't that bother you? You see, we, we should have people on our hearts, just like the priests in the Old Testament. They, they had that breastplate of precious stones. Each, each stone represented a tri- one of the tribes of the children of Israel, and they had them on their heart. Breastplate is always covering the heart, right? And they were supposed to have the, the, the priest, and we are priests, were supposed to have people, their people on their hearts. This is why they would go through the, the motions of the temple and the tabernacle. They were making atonement for the sins of all the people. And this is what Christ mourned for you and me. This is why he, he prayed in the garden. He was interceding for us with this type of mourning. In Romans, Paul says this, this is like groanings which cannot be uttered. God will help us to pray for others with groanings which cannot be uttered in articulate speech. And I don't know how that works. I've said this before. How can sorrow and joy be in the same heart? We, we think of uh, Christ going through the Gethsemane and going through the cross. And it was so, so dark and miserable for him, but there was, it was. But there was one element that we forget. It says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Through all that mourning, through all that suffering, he had joy. Why? Because he knew that through his suffering, there would be fruit. You and I entering the kingdom. He saw that. And that gave him strength. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Today's world says, oh, you've got to stand up for your own rights. You gotta sue, you gotta go to a lawyer right away, you gotta, whatever it takes, you gotta be demanding. Jesus says, no, you don't need to be that way. You can be mild, you can be gentle. You're supposed to be like a lamb. Oh, it is kinda sometimes pretty hard, at least for a man with testosterone, to, to be quiet and not do anything. You want to start fighting, you want to start swinging. No, no. See, this is what happens when you start growing spiritually. I need to be meek. And they shall inherit the earth. I've seen it so often. Those who demand their own rights and are always so interested for themselves, they're the ones that lose. And the meek person that comes along and he, God just blesses him. Some way or another, God... Now, this is also speaking future, but it's also speaking of how, what God can do to help the meek. You're supposed to be like that. And so through these different situations in our life, we're going to go through these different mood swings, these different emotions. And we're always supposed to go back to the word of God. Why does God let us go through that? Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Isn't it good to eat and to drink? One of the greatest pleasures we have, we we look forward to dinner. Some of you are already salivating at the mouth for the chicken you're going to have or whatever. It's good for us to experience hunger because then we can be filled. I hear he's talking about righteousness. And our hearts long after righteousness. Oh, how I want to be right with God. I have that assurance with that I know that I will go to heaven if I die. And that hunger and thirst drives you to the cross. And there you are filled with his righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Friend, the world teaches us to to retaliate and to be vindictive and, and to rejoice when somebody gets killed. All, all these movies out there, oh, there's all so much shooting and killing and, and, and they try to make the villain worthy of death. Oh, he's so evil. And then it's, oh, that's okay to blow him away. Friends, that, that, that is of the world, that's of the devil. We're supposed to be merciful. Somebody wrongs you. You don't need to retaliate. You need to pray for him. Feel sorry for him. The poor guy's on the wrong way or a road. 
Some people keep a little black book. Oh, I'm never going to forgive that person. I, I've heard it. Something that happened years ago. I'm never going to forgive that guy about what he did to me. Well, then God isn't going to forgive you. You keep that little black book. And you do not bring it to the cross. Friend, you will be sorry. In fact, I wonder if you really even have eternal life. Because there will be people on yonder day who will be not allowed to go into heaven because you did not forgive. That's what the Lord's Prayer says. That's serious. Can we let go of the flesh? See, this is why you have to come to the cross. Here, all that range of emotions that you go through. All those little things that have happened in your life that need to be dealt with, you let them go so that you may enter into life abundantly. As a Christian, you have eternal life, but this eternal life in you, the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 that we're supposed to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. How does that work? Because you have been bought with a price, redeemed by the blood of Christ, you are supposed to let the blood of Christ keep cleansing you and working in you. See, it is God who worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's actually the next verse. But he says, first, you have to work out that salvation that you receive from him. You have to work that out. It needs to be worked out in your life. Doesn't, it's not automatic. You must obey the leading of God's spirit. And when he says, just let that thing go, and you don't, you are disobeying him. And you will suffer for it. Blessed are the peacemakers. Oh, sorry. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. See, this is, again, working out your own salvation. With fear and trembling, the salvation you got from Christ purify your heart at the moment of salvation, but this is supposed to be worked out continually in your life by the renewing of the mind that you are transformed into the same image that God put into your heart. They shall see God. See, friends, when, when you understand that what, what is impure, oh, the first thing we think of, okay, pornography, that's impure, and it is. There's a lot of other things that are impure. These things are of the flesh, and they need to come to the cross. Your flesh needs to die and be planted at the cross. All those images and things that you have seen need to be covered by the blood of Christ. All of us have seen things that are not right. And sometimes Satan will try to use them, oh, we're supposed to be pure in heart. And then we will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Peacemakers. You want to be called the child of God? You have to make peace. As much as lieth in you, it says in Hebrews, make peace with your brother or sister. It doesn't matter if it costs you money. Money is nothing compared to the peace of God in your heart. If you got to go the extra mile, if you end up losing something, so be it. You have to die to yourself. All of us, every one of you, you've lost something. Some of you might be bitter about it. Somebody ripped you off. You ready to forgive? If not, God will let you go on. You go on. But you're not my child. You're not acting like my child. See, the eternal life in Christ that we have in our hearts wants us to work this out. Yeah, we will be tempted. We will go all th through all kinds of emotions. And yet we're supposed to let the blood of Christ cleanse us and work in us till we are at peace. Th these are some tough things I'm, I'm talking about. So some of you... 
are thinking about some things. I know that. I'm not pointing at anybody except myself. I, I know how this, some of this, these things work. You can get lost in living in the flesh and, and oh, it's not fair, and that guy, this guy. You have to leave it. How are you ever going to find peace and joy in your life? You see, this is what the psalmist, I believe, was doing. First, he was dealing with his flesh and, oh, thou art so far from me. Why, why have you left me, Lord? And he deals with the spiritual issues, and then he finds himself on his way, the light and the truth leading him to the hill of God. And it calls for dying to self. We are planted with him, together with him, in the likeness of his death, Romans 6, 4. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Friend, are you ready to be laughed at and scorned and mocked and hated? For the cause of Christ? I haven't always been ready. Sometimes all, all of a sudden, boom! What are you, a Christian? What are you going to say? I wasn't ready once. But Lord, I want to be ready every time. And I want to stand proudly in the face of any kind of reproach. You, yeah, you make fun of Christ. You make fun of me being a Christian. Having, this, having to have crutches. Oh, that's not just a crutch. You need to get through life. But I know the more that you taste and see that the Lord is good, and you see his power, the more you will actually be willing to suffer for him. See, that, see this is why we sang, So enchain my spirit's vision, Christ crucified. See, when you see Christ crucified, you're willing to die, for your, die to, your, to yourself. See, someone who does not want to forgive a Christian does not want to think about Christ hanging on that cross and saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He, he, he doesn't go there. Because right away that finger's pointing to him. What about your heart, buddy? You need to forgive then you're free. See, we don't, we don't realize how free we can really be in the spirit world by following spiritual principles. And they are so beautiful. The truth shall set you free. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Because they persecuted the prophets the same way. They persecuted Jesus. They wanted to kill him. So what are we supposed to do? Run away from? We're not supposed to openly try and get people riled up against us. But when it happens, and it will somewhere, somebody's going to laugh at us and scoff what we believe. We're supposed to be ready. And when they do, you know what's going to happen? You're going to feel real the glory of God in your heart. The same person that laughed at you will walk away feeling pretty bad about himself, but you will feel blessed. It says, they will even speak against all manner of evil against you falsely. Somebody lies about you and your faith, and it'll happen. Doesn't matter, you're free. This is the greatest reward that we, we can have is that, going back to summing up uh, Psalm 43 here. I need to quit. But he says, he ends up in a place of exceeding joy, verse 4. See, he says that the light of God and the truth of God leads him to thy holy hill and to thy tabernacles. What takes place at the tabernacles the sacrifice of lambs the sacrifice of the flesh your flesh that brings me when God's light shines into my heart it brings me to this place and when you allow God to work in your heart and you come to the altar of God verse 4 and this is where your flesh dies altar is a place of death place of sacrifice 
you would come into the exceeding joy of God. And I don't think I need to even apologize for thinking that many messages today in churches that are too liberal, they are deficient in the death of Christ and the death to self. I think it's true. This is why we see pastors going wrong. Whole ministries being hit with incredible accusations and going down in flames. It's because they should have spent more time. I'm not being critical. I'm just want to make sure that we don't go there. See, there is no joy except you die at the altar. Then you will have a song in the night. Verse 5, why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Here again, he's just been to the altar. He's just been to the hill of God. And just a little bit later, why art thou cast down? What's what's wrong with me? Why why, why am I so up yet? Why am I, I riled up? Why am I so anxious? You have problems with that? Being anxious? Worried? Some people, and I don't belittle this, some people say they have anxiety attacks. I I don't belittle that. uh, What's the answer for that? Turn your eyes to the cross. Die with Christ. Hope in God. Keep your eyes centered upon him, for he will bring you out of that. For I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. See, friends, I hope you will allow me to say some things due to being around for a few years. I, I, I'm not saying I've been around the block yet, but, but, but some, you, you learn a few things on the way. Uh, and one of those things is, how do you look at yourself? How, what, what is the health of your countenance supposed to look like? You're, you're supposed to actually, God wants you to actually feel good about yourself. But it only comes through dying to self. So you're not supposed to feel good about yourself because you make a lot of money and you're good looking and, you're, and people look up to you and you have a reputation that is quite good. You're supposed to feel good about yourself because of Christ living in you. That makes a difference. So here's another aspect of the Christian life. Well, how, what do you think of yourself? You feel like you're a piece of garbage, your life means nothing? So a lot of Christians have a problem with that. I've had a problem with that. Sometimes still. Oh man, I, 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 I don't know, I'm just not. I wonder if people even care about what I say. I, I have those th- thoughts. And yet, I need to keep my eyes on Christ. So what do you do when you are cast down? When your emotions don't follow the word of God and then the joy of the Lord? What do you do when you're totally uptight, anxious, afraid? You set your eyes upon the cross, upon Christ crucified. The old part of the flesh that is afraid and worried and anxious and disturbed, that part of you can die with Christ. You can get up from there in a state of total peace and total joy where you are not bothered. But you'll have to do this over and over again. But if you make it a habit, it becomes easier. And this is why Christ said, I have come that you might have life and life abundantly. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. See, a lot of Christians don't even realize it, but there is a thief. He's, he's going around, he's trying to steal, to kill, and to destroy. This, this is why we have, a lot of times we have these different emotions. Some of them are caused by evil spirits. And we, and we don't even think they exist. And then we don't, we don't even understand what's happening to us. But you have to resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And so in all our ways... There is a titanic 
spiritual battle taking place. Things happen to you, Satan is right there to condemn and to hurt and to try to destroy you and to kill you and to steal from you. But through it all, God, you, you, whatever it takes, you, whatever situation, whatever you are going through, you, you focus upon Christ. Even if you have to pray for an hour with deep, heartfelt conviction, God will bring you to a place where he, the joy starts rising up again. And you can start seeing clearly spiritually. And your life is set up on the rock. Your foot does not slip. That is the power of Christ in our life. You know, and it really has to do with him. You allowing him to dwell in you and, and his word. Abiding in his word. One final thought. The Old Testament this is found, I believe, in Deuteronomy chapter 8. God says, 40 years I tried you. I let you go through the wilderness. I gave you food and drink, and your shoe didn't get old. Why did I do that? Because I wanted to know what was in your heart. Why do, why do we go through things? God wants to know what is in your heart. And some people fail. Some people give up. Some people walk away and they backslide. What about you? Will you remain faithful no matter what? If you will, you will yet praise him who is the health of your countenance. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It is way better than any psychological teaching. It is the health of our countenance. We can rise up from a place of kneeling and know that we are blessed. Lord, I pray that each one of us would not depend on our emotions, but that we would walk by faith. And Lord, if emotions match our faith, then let us praise God. But Lord, through it all, through the depths of despair and through the loneliness of our hearts, Lord, I pray that you would guide and lead us into the light, that your light and truth would lead us to thy holy hill. Teach us, Lord, how we can have victory in Christ, how we need to die with Christ, be planted with him. So, Lord, may you be glorified in each one of our lives. We, we thank you for the revelation of God's word, Old Testament, New Testament, and it speaks to us personally today. May it your word, Lord, have an effect in us. May it bring forth fruit unto eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
I wish for each one of you that you overcome in your spiritual lives to such a degree that you will enter into glory and hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. I mentioned a lot of things in the world, things we need to overcome. What, what makes you an overcomer? It is your faith. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And this is why your faith needs to be centered upon the cross and the resurrection of Christ, because then you follow that. Yes, you die with Christ. Yes, it hurts to die to yourself and to carry your own cross, but once you're dead with him, then you truly start living. That's the glory of the cross. There is life forevermore right there. I want to thank each one of you for coming, taking part in the service. It's been good to see you. Let's bow for the benediction. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week in the Lord.